Chemistry and Philosophy of Science and Medicine. I'm Matt Brown, and today we're talking again about Paul Feyerabend and his book Against Method. We're talking about part two, um, which covers roughly chapters eight through 14. Um, so I want to remind you a little bit of where we, uh, where we were last time. So Feyerabend's overall goal in the book is to criticize philosophical uh, and popular theories of the scientific method um, and the idea of science as a kind of uh, rational, rule-governed pursuit that can be uh, sort of explained uh, with one shared structure across all sciences and all history, right? Um, history of science. Uh, he's, he's trying to oppose that. In order to oppose that notion, Feyerabend uh, articulates uh, a kind of a methodological principle that he thinks no, um, no philosopher of science would agree to. He calls it counter-induction. Counter-induction is basically the idea that um, science should proceed, uh, is, a, is a methodological principle according to which you should proceed by positing and, and pursuing and sticking to theories that go against uh, other well-confirmed theories and go against uh, uh, established empirical data right, or, or empirical evidence. Um, so this is the, this these, this counter induction principle um, is uh, is meant to be something that no sort of rationalist account of scientific method would accept. And he attempts to show us that Galileo and Galileo's defense of Copernicanism in particular um, is engaged in a kind of counter inductive method. And he ends the discussion that we talked about last week with uh, what's called the tower argument, right? So this is, um, this is uh, an ancient argument uh, against the heliocentric uh, model of the solar system, against the idea that the Earth uh, moves rather than being stationary at the center of the universe. Um, and the idea is um, if you drop uh, a weight or, or a ball or, or anything from the top of a tall tower, um, it falls straight down uh, the same distance from the tower is where you dropped it. If the tower is, uh, you know, uh, perpendicular to the, to the ground. Um, and uh, um, if, if the earth was moving, uh, the tower argument goes, you would expect the ball to fall away from the tower um, at roughly the same rate that the earth was moving, right? Um, and there, uh, I'll, I'll post um, some video examples of, of how this works. Um, it's supposed to work. Okay, so that was last time. Uh, the tower argument is supposed to be evidence against Copernicanism, it was considered as a refuting uh, evidence against Copernicanism. H uh, however, right, Galileo provided alternative interpretations of that evidence using his new dynamics, his new physical dynamics, and his new um, theory of uh, what you would call um, relativity, his theory, the Galilean theory of relativity, of relative motion, um, to show that it actually was consistent with Copernicus. Right, so he, he, he showed that there was a kind of natural interpretive assumption um, or natural interpretation packaged with the tower argument evidence um, and that one could replace that with a speculative theoretical assumption in order to turn the evidence against the theory into evidence for the theory. Okay, so um, this week, right, um, Feyerabend continues the argument but he focuses instead on, uh, instead of on the tower argument, he focuses on the telescopic evidence, right? So uh, Galileo, of course, um, was one of the first to build and use a functioning telescope to study the stars, right? Um, and uh, to study the heavens, right? And uh, he did a number of things such as uh, uh, study the, the surface features of the moon, but it was, a, it was a planetary body with features much like the features of the earth, uh, mountains and things, right? Mountains and plains and so on. Um, he also discovered 
uh, satellites around um, Jupiter, right? Uh, they were called the, the Jovian planets at that time. Um, and these were supposed to be evidence in favor of Copernicanism. Um, he also was able to uh, provide alternative evidence to um, what seemed to be the case uh, that, that um, you know, you would expect when you observe planets like Mars and Venus, which sometimes are very close to the Earth and sometimes very far away from the Earth on the Copernican model, uh, to vary in size and brightness, much more so than they do um, in actual observation with the naked eye. Um, and Galileo was uh, able to provide some evidence um, that uh, using telescopic observations that things were closer than you would expect using naked eye observations to the Copernican model. Okay, um, that's all very technical and uh, complicated, but, um, or at least a little bit to explain, but the, the basic idea is um, Galileo used the telescope as a source of evidence for Copernicanism. Um, what Feyerabend points out is that that is a really dubious source of evidence for a number of reasons. Number one, um, because there were good Aristotelian reasons to think that um, uh, things work very differently in the heavens than they do on the earth, and including um, uh, observation, right? Uh, number two, because Galileo did not have a very strong understanding of the nature of optics, um, nor of the nature of, of the perceptual workings of the human uh, body and mind, right? And um, so he didn't have very strong reasons for thinking that the telescope produced veridical or true uh, perceptions rather than illusions, right? Um, he didn't have good reasons to think it was more like um, it, that it was, it was more like na uh, natural perception magnified than it was like looking through a kaleidoscope or something like that, right? So that's another problem for the telescopic observations. Finally, many of Galileo's peers could not confirm what Galileo claimed to see through the telescope, uh, and they saw different things. Um, or they saw nothing at all. They could make clear images out. They saw double. Um, and even Galileo himself saw things that we now regard as illusory, um, including uh, if you look at the diagram in the book on page 97 that he drew of the moon, um, and you compare that to a photograph of the moon on page 109, you'll see that uh, these are quite different quite different pictures. Let me see if I can show you here. So um, on the one hand, right, uh, note this enormous crater in the middle of the picture towards the bottom. Um, if you look at uh, a similarly uh, matched contemporary photograph of the moon, um, this is on 109, uh, you know, there are some craters down here, but none of them are nearly as large uh, or as perfectly circular as the one Galileo uh, depicted. So um, uh, even Galileo's telescopic evidence was not, uh, not from contemporary standards very good, right? Um, so here you have a set of evidence. It does seem to support Copernicanism, but it seems to have its own host of problems. And yet there was the, the mutual fit between the apparently refuted thesis of Copernicanism and the apparently refuted uh, observational technique of the telescope um, gave mutual support to each other and gave defenders of the view reason to, uh, to stick with it, right? You combine that with um, Galileo's dynamics, which also went against common sense in various ways, um, and his theory of relativity. And again, you have this mutual support between these different parts of the theory. Um, one of the things that's going on here is that the Copernicans have to deal with the, the fact that the Aristotelian system of knowledge is very tightly linked together. So you have Ptolemy's Earth-centered astronomy, and that's what Copernicus is trying to reject. You also have Aristotle's physics, his, his theory of, of change and dynamics, which is a much more robust 
um, and inclusive theory than the one Galileo posited. It's true that Galileo's theory um, does help us think about the relationship between the heavens um, and the earth, um, but uh, Aristotle's theory of change is much more comprehensive. It doesn't just concern motions of bodies, but also concerns um, the generation and growth and decay of animals, um, the change of mental phenomenon, including perception, and a variety of other processes of qualitative and, and quantitative change united in one theory. Um, you also have uh, various um, uh, theories of optics and perception, theories of um, th theological accounts, all of which are, are mutually supporting system uh, in the Aristotelian worldview. And, and the Copernicans can't develop all of the same, uh, they can't develop a robust alternative all at once, right? The astronomy comes first, right? It's not, it's not great. I mean, it doesn't provide a lot of um, predictive improvement. Uh, it does provide some, you know, it's some easier calculations here and there uh, as compared to Ptolemy. Um, so it's, it's kind of pragmatically useful, but not so uh, empirically different. Um, the uh, Galileo's dynamics um, are, have some benefits, but are also extremely problematic. Um, and it would take um, centuries before you full, had a fully robust account of all of these things together uh, that was a rival to um, the Aristotelian approach. But by that time, Aristotle was not even a live consideration, right? Um, now, Feyerabend does not uh, tell us all of this in order to tell us that there was something wrong with Galileo. This is not a criticism of Copernicus, not a criticism of Galileo. Um, this, is a, this is an argument about the historical development of science. Perfectly reasonable, in one sense, um, for what uh, Copernicus and Galileo did. And in fact, um, if we agree with most uh, defenders of modern science that Galileo was, was right, um, then we also need to preserve the kinds of strategies, uh, scientific strategies that Galileo pursued that made him right. right? And those strategies, Feyerabend argues, um, are ones that go against modern theories of scientific method. Uh, indeed, you can, you can think about it this way. If, uh, if the modern philosophers of scientific method had their way, um, Galileo uh, would never have gotten off the ground. Uh, the Copernican theory would have been uh, dead in the cradle, so to speak, and um, we would all still be Aristotelians. That's the main line of argument in, in this part of the book. Um, there is also an interesting discussion about the, um, the church in chapter 14 um, and the other aspects of the Copernican revolution in chapter 14. Um, and so it, what's happening here towards the end of this is, is um, Feyerabend starting to explore some of the broader ramifications of, of his account. Um, uh, including uh, thinking about um, the sort of historical change of standards of rationality, the relationship between ethics and social, the social good and science, um, and some other aspects like that that we'll get into more um, in the next in the next two parts of the book. Um, so that's a that's a brief uh, sort of um, introduction to uh, part two of Against Method. Um, and the main argumental, argumentative structures there. Lots of details for us to talk about uh, in class or in the chat on Discord or uh, in comments on the video. Um, please let me know if you have any questions or, or comments about that. Otherwise, uh, I look forward to talking with you uh, and I'll see you next time.